We have to turn to the health budget because that's what's under intense scrutiny today. Another cabinet meeting to discuss the budget held earlier. There'll be another one, we believe, later on. Here's what Michael Noonan had been saying about the decisions to be made and what he's, what can only be described as the pain to come. There's pain everywhere. Think where we were this time last year when the whole country was in an emergency and the European authorities and the IMF had to come in and the Greens were in the government and they were out of the government and we didn't know at this time last year whether there would even be a budget. That's where we've come from and it's only eight months ago. And while we've made significant progress, it's only the start of a longer journey. No one is hiding the fact that this is going to be a tough budget. And, uh, but there, there is no problem with constructing this budget. Uh, but obviously uh, ministers, as ministers will do, try to protect their own budgets. But in the end of the day, uh, the cabinet will make decisions. But it's not going to be painless. Whoever said it was going to be painless? Uh, we are making adjustments which consist of uh, expenditure cuts and tax increases. Uh, I think uh, the numbers you're familiar with, it's 1.6 uh, billion on the tax side and it's 2.2 on the expenditure side. And when it comes to the expenditure, my colleague Brendan Howland has already announced that of the 2.2, two, uh, 750 of it will be achieved uh, through cuts on the capital budget. So there's a sum of uh, 1450, 1.450 uh, billion left on the current side. Now when you try to get cuts on the current side, most departments have small enough budgets so they don't throw up very significant health, very very significant cuts. So it comes down to sharing the burden between uh, social welfare, uh, health and education. And uh, we're working our way through uh, policy proposals from the ministers on these issues. Michael Noonan speaking earlier. Did you hear the fella ringing the bell in the background? Really, for whom the bell tolls? Uh, Michal Martin in the Doyle put his finger on it earlier on. I mean, no one's going to ignore Fianna Fáil's role in getting us to the point at which we are at, where these unbelievable measures are even being countenanced. Uh, Michal Martin said the government is frightening the living daylights out of everyone, and that's what most people would have thought when they read the newspaper this morning or they listened to Ivan and Chris on News Talk Breakfast talking about this 50 euro charge on medical card holders, this increase of on the 50 cent prescription charge you'd have to wonder if they are putting 20 unpalatable options before us only to give us five of them on the day and try and convince us we should be grateful uh, that they avoid, avoided the rest um, a lot of people are very worried about what James Riley told TDs last night that was leaked out and uh, for all of us to consider we've been on the streets of Cork asking people what they thought about what Minister Riley is considering you know, people are struggling as it is, like, you know, it's unbelievable, like, it is just desperate, like, you know. They could do cuts and other things without that, you know what I mean? It's a disgrace. I have no problem with the 50 euro. I have with the closing the nursing homes. If they're up to standard, they shouldn't be closed down. Yes, bring them up to standard. Like, if they close them, where do the people go? Oh, I think it's disgraceful altogether. They promised us so much beforehand, and now they've reneged in it all. I mean, where's their word? We don't believe them at all. We criticise Fianna Fáil. Now Fianna Gael and Labour are trying to fight it. So it's, uh, it's very unjust. I mean, they should stay, stand by their word. We'd never trust them again. Very unfair. And I think a lot of people won't vote. This will encourage people not to vote in the future. Because you know, they can't give you their word. They can't, they can't stand by it. They have to get money somewhere. The country is in dire state. So if they don't get money where we are, we are in the deep, 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 deep end. The only thing they take it off themselves, which of course they are not. Whereas I'm on the old age, I will have to fuck out more. I'd be mostly, I'd be against it, of course, yeah. Yeah, but uh, it's, it's, I suppose it's making the, the weaker and the, the socio economic group, the weaker group pay for what the sins of the majority, you know, or the, the minority at the top, you know. So I'd be opposed to it, of course, yeah. It's almost a sense of resignation listening to those voices there about what is coming. Um, let's bring in Professor John Crown, Senator John Crown on the line. John Crown, Micheál Martin is right. They are scaring the living daylights out of people and we just don't know what is going to be implemented and what isn't. 
Well, well Jonathan, uh, those those cuts and those changes which are, are being rumoured uh, certainly would be very frightening, and in particular the charge for medical cards, the increase in prescription charges, together with you know the, the inevitability that if they're talking about the scale uh, of savings that they're making, that there will be all kinds of uh, cutbacks in other areas of service. Uh, I, and I must say, I just get a sense that for, for poorer people who really depend on the health service, for people with sick children, for older people, people on fixed incomes or people who are dependent on social welfare support, I just don't think they can afford any of this. And I think we really have to look critically at alternative means of redressing the finances. And, you know, my own feeling is that people who make a lot of money like me should pay more tax. People who have big salaries from the public health service should have those salaries decreased. And critically, I think we need to end mandatory retirement in the health service, where we have this ludicrous situation where fit, healthy, mentally agile 65-year-olds are forced to become dependents of the state. Uh, on the occasion of their 65th birthday. There are a lot of things we need to do. I think doing these things is wrong. The €50 charge on medical card holders. The medical card is there for a reason. It's to support people who can't afford private uh, GP care and hospital care. Mm. It makes no sense to me that they would charge a blanket tax, a €50 tax on it. Why don't they consider something like they did with the prescription? Every time you go, you pay a nominal fee. Well, you know, there is, you know, one learns quickly when one gets into Leinster House that some of the, the more cynical sides of politics, uh, and the, the rumour is strongly doing the rounds that what was happened was that the Department of Health and the Minister was presented with an ultimatum that an additional degree of cutback beyond those which had been anticipated was going to be requested, and the sort of broadside response was, well, if you're going to ask us to cut funding, well, this is what we're going to have to do. Uh, the theory being that perhaps there was a little bit of uh, finger-pointing going on across the two party sides of the cabinet table uh, as to which constituencies uh, would bear the greatest burden with different kinds of cutbacks. So I don't, we have had no verification that this is actually going to happen or if it is written in stone. There is some debate at the moment as to exactly how much time the Shannon will even have to debate the, uh, to, to debate the budget uh, prior to its uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Alona Duffy also joins us on News Talk Lunchtime. Alona, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. How concerned are patients of yours by something like this? Well, already people are arriving in today and they are frightened. And I think, again, Michael Noonan talked about sharing the burden and sharing the pain. That's not what's happening here. These cuts are going to be focused, as John has just already said, on the vulnerable, on those with family and young kids, on the elderly and those with chronic illnesses. And I think, you know, especially those with children, they're already frightened. You know, there was the rumour that we were going to see a cut in the childcare for these people. Now the rumour has become a probable fact. So they're going to be hit with that. They're now going to be hit with a charge for a medical card. And I mean, I mean there's no clarification. Will, will it be a charge per person in a family? So if you have three kids, you're going to be paying €250 Euro in a year. For these people, they don't have that kind of money added to that prescription fees again money people who are on the breadline don't have and as you've already stated they have a medical card for a reason they have a medical card because they're mainly on social welfare they're people who are ill and you know going to have to attend doctors going to have to have medications and if they don't do that they're going to get sicker and that's the reality of it we all got um, quite animated about the 50 cent prescription charge when that came in because that was, uh, some would view, quite onerous on people. But we had uh, Dr. Rory Hanley on the programme last week and he was saying that actually had a positive effect, uh, somewhat unexpected, that p- people were not getting medication as regularly as they would have used to and that there wasn't this build-up in their cabinet of stuff they didn't need. So uh, increasing that to €2, Euro, what impact would that have? I think there's a big jump from 50 cents to 2 euro. And I think if you think of an elderly person who might be on six, seven, eight medications, you could be talking about 20 euro in a month on top of the other fee as well. And, you know, they're already, we're already seeing cuts. We're already seeing changes. And, okay, there haven't been cuts in the old age pension yet. But, I mean, they are talking about cuts to those on, on other kind of allowances like the, the back-to-work schemes and all of that. And, again, for the elderly, the other big concern for them is, I mean, we haven't mentioned it yet, is the closure of, of nursing home beds and with a view mm. to possibly closing nursing homes. I mean, I'm not sure where the minister thinks these patients are going to go to. He already knows and he's already discussed this, that it is far more effective, cost-effective-wise to have these kind of patients in nursing homes and not, as has been described, clogging up acute hospital beds. That's what's going to happen. These patients cannot be at home. If they require a nursing home, there's no means of caring for them at home. They're going to be back into the A&Es, adding to the problems there and taking up more hospital beds. And again, we can expect more bed closures in the hospitals. I mean, I had a meeting with management this week and there were talks about increasing the number of weeks per three months that we close different beds in hospitals and close out patient clinics and elective surgeries. So things are getting worse and worse. But the problem is, you know, it's not like closing a shop or closing a cinema and saying, well, people can wait. If people are sick, they can't wait. They need that attention now, full stop.
Uh, John, can I ask you, John Crown, uh, the point I was trying to make earlier on is that the government is throwing all of this out there. They've unpalatable choices. We know the dire financial situation. The people in that box pop from Cork we played earlier on, uh, they, they said that quite clearly. We know where we are. But at the same time, are they doing this in a drip feed whereby they do give us 20 things that are completely and utterly unconscionable? They implement five and then the other 15 said, well, we could have gone down that road, but we didn't. And aren't we great for not doing that? Uh, that certainly is one interpretation which I've heard articulated, Jonathan, and it may well be the case that this is part of a, a very high-end and very frightening PR exercise. I, I, I hope so, I, but certainly some of the things which are actually being uh, uh, you know, considered as possibilities, I think, would be, would be unconscionable. What, do you, what are the alternatives, though? If James Riley has to cut his budget, he's got the second biggest expenditure, he's going to have to make decisions that are going to impact on patients. There, as Michael Noonan said, cannot be no pain in this. Well, I mean, it's very hard to soundbite this, but I mean, the reality is that we have a fundamentally highly inefficient health service, which is riddled with inconsistencies, which gobble up money. There, there is no way that you can run a health service cheaply, and I'm not naive about that, and there will have to be efficiencies, but I think there would have... I would suggest a dramatic reduction in the number of bureaucratic staff. I would suggest a further reduction already, it has happened, but a further reduction in that which is paid to high earners like, like consultants, like GPs, like higher echelons of the, of the civil service, like those who are in the, the higher echelons of the administration, administration crankocracy. I would have a real critical look at the use of generic drugs, which I think is happening already. I think that needs to be done. And I think we need to have a real cultural change in terms of uh, educating doctors and cost cost value uh, for society in terms of some of the things which we do. Well, we had Brendan Howland last week telling us that he is going to reform uh, pretty much all the state services, including the HSE. Do you not have the same confidence he has that he's going to be able to achieve that? Well, I think that they're dealing with an extremely entrenched and very powerful bureaucracy, which has uh, resisted all attempts to change over multiple governments. I I think the real problem here is that the greatest vested interest we have in the entire health service is the bureaucracy which runs it. And I think unless we have a real fundamental attitude that we're going to have a clearing out sale of the the structures that we have and get rid of... not just the people, but the structures that hire them for running the health service in its current command and control fashion, we are always going to be very inefficient and very unfair, I hasten to add. I mean, at the core of the problem is we have a health service which is run, administered and legislated by people who don't use it because they all have private health insurance and use a different health service. Uh, look at the cre- yeah, I was going to yeah, say go about the HSC. I mean, since the creation of the HSC, we've seen this completely dramatic jump in the number of, of administrative staff, and that hasn't been commensurate with the numbers that we've seen in the increase in clinical staff. And again, all along we've been told there won't be cuts in frontline service. I think this is, this is absolute proof that there will be cuts because it's easier to make cuts in, in, you know, put in a cost, put in something without looking, as John has said, at the whole structure of the HSC, the whole structure of our health service, and kind of see how do we get that money to be used for frontline services, for the patients, not for the planning of it, not for the bureaucracy of it, not for all the managers and everybody that they have underneath them. And we do need some of those, but we can drastically cut back on those. There's there's also a suggestion that there's a real fundamental problem with the way the HSE does its accounting business. And I, I've heard people who are in the know about, you know, management accounting saying that the word fantasy accounting is probably the best way to describe a lot of the numbers which are captured by the HSE. Absolutely. I think, you know, this is something that, that at this stage we should have better accounting. We should, uh, numbers, even things with regards to illnesses, patients, patient attendances, what we have should be going on. Everything's computerized now. This should have been looked at long ago and would help with costs. But one other example of how things do not work. We were told that there was going to be centralization of the processing of medical cards and every Everybody said, this is going to make it better. It'll be streamlined. Patients will have medical cards within two weeks if they do it online. Can and I what's tell it like you? Now? Well, at the moment, we had a GP on recently at a meeting telling us that when he contacted Dublin, the central office, about it, that they said they were only processing the August medical cards now. So I had a couple in last week. They're in their 70s. Both of them have heart disease. One of them waiting on an angiogram to be done. They lost their medical card. They have no n- notion why. They'd have got no letter. They were just told no medical card. They absolutely flipped and freaked out because they rang the matter where they were going to have the angiogram and said, well, will there be a cost? Now, obviously, you know, they didn't explain their case right and they were told, well, yeah, there, there'll be a cost. It, you know, they presumed that meant the full cost of an angiogram. They had heard anecdotally what an angiogram could cost. They weren't going to go for it. 
they're afraid now to come to me thinking I'm going to charge them. They're afraid to go to their outpatient clinics. They're having to pay 120 euro a month for their medications. All of this is wrong. We have babies mm. who are six and seven months old whose whole families have medical cards and they still don't have a medical card. So, I mean, we have to look. How easy can it be to, to get that right and yet they're still yeah. getting it wrong? John, can I just ask you both before I let you go because I am conscious of the time here. Um, John, can I ask you and Alona the same question? First, John, what do you think is actually going to happen? We have these kites being flown by James Riley. You, you know the system better than most, both of you. Uh, what do you think is actually going to happen on the 6th of December? I think there will be widespread cuts in the provision of services in the health service. I think the health service, uh, in terms of the frontline services, not the administrative side, which apparently cannot be tackled, is For already pared to the bone and muscle. The fat is largely gone in the actual provision of health service, and it's very hard to see any further large-scale cuts not causing a big problem. One other thing I'm very worried about is that people uh, shouldn't lose confidence in the VHI because the biggest catastrophe that could apply to the public health service would be if there was a wholesale move of people into the public service, which cannot at the moment cope with the demand that is being placed on it by people who are fleeing any perception of a problem with the provision of services by the private insurers. So I think that also needs to be looked at as well. Uh, well, for me, what I'd say is I would say that there will be uproar over this 50-euro charge for the medical card, and that may be one that's back down on. But I think there will be lots of other hidden but detri- detrimental cuts, such as the nursing home, such as you know cutting back in caring hours and uh, for, for vulnerable patients like the elderly and like handicapped kids. And I think that's where we're going to see it. But unfortunately, these are the people that won't have the strong voice, and they will suffer. OK, Dr. Alona Duffy, GP in Monaghan, Professor John Crown and a senator, um, an oncologist at St. Vincent's as well. Uh, let's play that audio again from Leinster House earlier. The Taoiseach saying those proposals uh, for the dramatic cuts in the health service are only the part of a normal process of pre-budget discussion. The Cabinet is going to meet again now in, in the afternoon to continue talks on the budget. Enda Kenny signalling that the areas of nursing homes and community hospitals, uh, there was this suggestion last night from James Riley they could close 40 to 45 community nursing homes. Um, Enda Kenny in the Doyle did admit that's something they're looking at. I uh, understand exactly um, the quality and the challenge uh, that frontline staff and carers and workers in community hospitals have to face. But I'm also a realist. Uh, Many of these buildings are very old. Many of them require pretty serious refurbishment. Many of them require very costly uh, maintenance and upkeep. We're going to come back a little bit later on to what Enda Kenny said about Labour, but let's hear from the Minister for Finance, Michael Noonan, as well. This is what he had to say about the pain that was to come in the budget. There's pain everywhere. Think where we were this time last year when the whole country was in an emergency and the European authorities and the IMF had to come in and the Greens were in the government and they were out of the government and we didn't know at this time last year whether there would even be a budget. That's where we've come from and it's only eight months ago. And while we've made significant progress, it's only the start of a longer journey. No one is hiding the fact that this is going to be a tough budget. And, uh, but there, there is no problem with constructing this budget. Uh, but obviously uh, ministers, as ministers will do, try to protect their own budgets. But in the end of the day, uh, the cabinet will make decisions. But it's not going to be painless. Whoever said it was going to be painless? I don't think anybody ever said it was going to be painless. It's about how painful it's going to be, Minister. And we had a Fine Gael backbencher expressing concern about the lack of public sector reform, given the difficult choices facing the government in the budget. Regina Doherty, she was at that briefing with James Riley last night. She said she found it startling that so much of the government's budget is protected by the Croke Park Agreement and said it was difficult to ask members of the public to play their part in the recovery when certain sanctions and sections are insulated from any kind of cuts. She was speaking on your well, now, this is a personal opinion, so don't, you know, slate every other Fine Gael, uh, minister or TD on this personal opinion. I think we're coming very close to realising that that is not working. Ordinary people who had no part um, or play in the disastrous situation as this country finds itself from an economic perspective today are being asked to take uh, cuts in very small incomes when you have a huge section of society that are completely protected and insulated. Here's what Enda Kenny said about Labour in the Doyle earlier on. He chose his words. I suppose you always choose your words carefully, but I wonder what he meant by this. Deputy Gilmore and myself and our colleagues agreed on a programme for government subsequently. The Labour Party programme was very clear prior to the election. 
Shane Coleman, Newstalk's political editor, joins us. Shane, that was uh, rather dismissive of the Labour Party promises pre-election, wasn't it? It was. It was quite a pointed uh, comment from Enda Kenny, and you had to, you have to think he knew exactly what he was saying. And certainly, there was an uncomfortable reaction on the Labour backbenchers when he said it and the gist of what he said basically was well Labour might have promised that before the general election but it's not in the programme for government and I suppose the implication of that is maybe Labour promised a little bit too much uh, before the general election and just the first signs uh, Jonathan of tensions between the two government parties on this issue and I think more uh, particularly tensions between the health minister James Riley and the uh, Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform Brendan Howland because it seems as if the stories we're hearing about Brendan Howland getting tough and saying you have to deliver these savings are are proving true and James Riley seems particularly uncomfortable with the level of cutbacks that he is going to have to introduce. Now, uh, some doubt as to how just how big that figure is. Some of the papers were reporting 500 million euros today. I would think that's a little on the Conservative side, just on the simple basis if you take social welfare being 700 million, add that 500 million to it, that's 1.2 billion. That still leaves another billion euros to get to the 2.2 billion that the government need to get. And okay. I, I can't see them coming up with one billion from the other departments, given that these two are the big, big spending departments. Shane, um, uh, look, the Minister for Finance is right. We, this is going to be painful. We know it's going to be painful. Nobody said it wasn't. But at the same time, are we watching political horse trading play out? And what you're doing is you are frightening people by saying, look, this is what we're considering. Look how bad it could possibly be. I think it is political horse trading uh, going on. And I, I'm just... Uh, it's certainly a view among some of of the uh, people in Fine Gael and Labour watching this is that there's a battle going on for resources. Uh, James Riley has been told he needs to cut X from his budget and he is just making it clear to Fine Gael and to Labour deputies that if he is going to cut X from his budget, this is what it will mean in practical terms. The time thing you were talking about earlier on, the €50 Euro annual charge for medical cards, the closure of uh, of, of these various uh, uh, community nursing units, the uh, the fourfold increase in the prescription charge. Um, I, it's diff- I mean, some people are saying, look, this is just scaremongering, they're just throwing up kites. But I think given the figures that we're talking about and given that so much of government spending is ring-fenced, i.e. the the public sector pay bill cannot be touched, then I think, uh, I mean, some of these kites, are they're not just kites, these are very realistic things that could Mm. and very probably will happen in the budget. Look, nobody said it was going to be easy for Fine Gael to go into government with Labour on this one, but the type of comment that Enda Kenny made there, um, that's going to make it very awkward. We know certain Labour ministers have their heads down and they know that difficult decisions are coming, but the same point we made the other day, if you're in a Labour seat uh, that mightn't necessarily be the most secure, despite the bump you would have gotten at the last election, uh, we're going to see people walking away because what's being considered is just unpalatable. Well, I think it's inevitable. I think if you have a budget, for example, that brings a fifty euro annual charge on medical cards, I think it is inevitable that you will lose uh, so, some deputies along the way. I, I can't see any other outcome. Uh, I mean, to, again, talking to deputies privately, they would say privately, "Look, there are certainly some people uh, who are in receipt of a medical card who can afford to pay fifty euros, uh, but there's also a lot of people who can't." And politically. No matter what way you look at it, this is an absolute. This is as big for this, this government is, uh, as as the Fianna Fáil move to take away the automatic right to a medical card for the over seventies. So how would they deal? How would they big. deal with the test chain? Because okay, fair enough. They, we, as Ivan said yesterday on the program, well, they might lose a man overboard here or there. But overall, are they are they up for this? Well, I, I suppose the next. Uh, 10 days w- will tell they don't have a choice but to be uh, up to it and I mean interesting the, the dynamic that's going on there I mean I, I was making a point about uh, the James Riley and Brendan ha- ha- Brendan Howland seem to be at loggerheads on this but not coming from the you know the traditional backgrounds you would expect <laughs> um, James Riley of fit from Fine Gael and Brendan Howland of Labour now you would almost expect them to be on, on the opposite sides on, on this but certainly you get the impression from Michael Noonan and uh, from Brendan Howland that whatever it takes to get to 3.6 billion they will do and they don't have any choice in it. The problem of course for the government John and I know I sound like a broken record on this issue but it is as relevant now as or more relevant now than it was eight months ago. The problem is the government over promised uh, before the election and even after the election and you just have to wonder 
why James Riley gave that hostage to Fortune after becoming Minister uh, for Health that he was going to get rid of the 50 cent prescription charge for medical mm. card patients. Again, talking to deputies around Dáil Éireann, most of them privately think that uh, prescription charge is a valid and justifiable thing because they say it, it, it limits the demand uh, fr- from, uh, from patients. And certainly from an economy point of view, it was always going to be very difficult to get rid of it. And now the government is looking at it like it's going to have to increase it. So another example of promising something and then having to U-turn it just a small number of months later. Shane Coleman, News Talks political editor. Thanks for that, Shane. On that point, let's bring in Dr. Rory Hanley, a GP and columnist with the Irish Medical Times. You were listening last hour to Doctors Ilona Duffy and Professor John Crown. Rory, last week you were telling us the 50 cent prescription charge, onerous as it may have seemed at the time, actually resulted uh, in a reduction in the amount of medicine that was paid for by the state. Uh, would a medical charge like the 50 euro that's being discussed be a bad thing or something similar? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. I think we need to get real on this, Jonathan. Uh, I mean, to listen to some of the comments earlier on, you'd swear this was the return of the workhouses, this was Armageddon. I heard similar kind of stuff when the prescription charge was announced. And as Shane Coleman was just pointing out there, a lot of politicians, a lot of media commentators went hysterical over that. What happened? It turned out to be a very good thing and saves a lot of money. Now, you're asking me if a 50 year uh, charge, 50 euro a year charge on a medical card would have the same effect. I think it's a very tricky one, this, but let's ask ourselves a question. 60% of the population doesn't have a medical card. They have to pay 40 or 50 euros when they see their GP. If you said to them you could have free GP care for an entire year for less than one euro a week, I think they'd jump at it. So we have to ask ourselves, who's going to pay for the GP care? Because there is no such thing as free care. We've had a massive increase in the number of medical cards in Ireland with people unemployed. The state is bankrupt. We're in a very tricky situation. We have to get real. I think a 50 euro across the board charge might be a bit of a crude instrument. You'd have to create exceptions. You'd have to remove certain people from the payment, exempt them, like people with severe illnesses, people who are terminally ill and so on. But... At the same time, there is a case to be made for a small nominal payment uh, for GP services along the lines of the prescription charge. The way I would suggest it, the way I would do it, was I would say people could have a certain number of free visits a year, and after that, a small nominal payment. It would prevent overuse of the system. It would be a revenue stream for the government, and it would not have a dramatically negative impact on people's health. That's what I believe. Is there not a certain irony? Last time we had you on, we were talking about the government's proposals to roll out free GP care for all, and here they are actually considering a €50 euro charge uh, on the existing people who have medical cards. Exactly, yeah, but see, this is, this is the point I was making last time. Uh, free GP care. What is free GP care? Somebody has to pay for it. It's not free. So whether it's you paying for it in your taxes or whether it's you paying for it uh, uh, out of your pocket, that's what happens. But you see, the other thing you have to realise, if we don't do this, if we don't create a small nominal charge for medical card holders, uh, and again I say it would have to be very carefully done that the vulnerable weren't uh, harmed, but if we don't do it, the people who are going to pay for it are the taxpayers who don't have medical cards. So you're going to hammer those people. They're going to have to pay more taxes to pay for the medical because that's that's how it works the money has to come from somewhere so who are you going to hit here Uh, and that's the question so what i think we're seeing here your your previous uh shane there was mentioned about horse trading and so on Mm. i think we're seeing a bit of a game going on here because what i think is going to happen is they're going to float this kite of the 50 euro charge labor are going to kick up uh the government will then back off labor will claim a victory because they're going to lose on the child benefit thing right and then they're going to turn around and probably shut down a lot of nursing home beds, maybe even shut down a few A&Es around the country and say, well, look, we didn't tax the medical card, aren't we a great bunch of lads? That's mm. the kind of thing I think we're going to see here. And I would be far, far more concerned about the closure of nursing home beds yeah. and the A&E service than a very small nominal charge for some medical card holders. Let's talk about that, because Enda Kenny said that specifically in the Doyle, that a lot of these nursing homes that they're talking about, the buildings are, are, are decrepit, they're, they're falling down around the ears of the patients who are inside. It's very difficult to provide proper care for the people who are there. He's talking about closing them down. I haven't exactly heard anyone talking about opening them up somewhere else in a brand new facility. One would assume that isn't what's going to happen. Yeah, this is the great, uh, I call it the a la carte approach to health and safety, you know. So some organisation like Hickway goes in and says, this building is unsafe, all these people have to leave. And they go home with nobody's look after them, and that's supposedly safer when 
repetitively it is not they're, they're in a nursing home because they can't fend for themselves but it could tick the relevant box and that's the end this is the problem you see so uh, what I'm seeing here is a classic example of using the old health and safety argument to justify a draconian cutback we saw that also with uh, certain a e departments around the country and we're probably going to hear it again it's, it's, a, it's a gutless argument frankly and doesn't stand up to scrutiny because the first rule of being a doctor is don't make people worse don't make people sicker don't make people feel worse so if a nursing home if you're going to shut down a nursing home as you've pointed out there you have to have somewhere better to send people somewhere safer uh, otherwise you're just making things worse I know you were making the argument earlier on the 50 euros not an awful lot considering what you get out of it but do we talk about making people worse um, there's a lot of people around the country I don't know if you heard the vox pop we had uh, from elderly people in Cork earlier on they're all very worried about this I mean it's only a 50 euro charge but they know once you open the floodgates like yeah. with the 50 cent prescription charge soon that could become a 2 euro prescription charge so 50 yeah. euro could become 200 euro Well there's always that risk that is true but at the same time as I say you know the state just simply does not have the money and somebody's going to have to pay for it so Let's ask ourselves a question. Um, OK, maybe a 50 euro across the board charge might be cr- a cruel instrument. You would have to be very careful. But I go back to what I was suggesting. If people can get a certain number of free GP visits a year, uh, mm. that would be fair, of course. And if people with certain severe illnesses or so on needed extra care, they should get that free, of course. But uh, there has to be a small nominal charge. I think there will have to be a small nominal charge to prevent overuse of the service and to create extra revenue for the state. And I think that's reasonable. It has to be done a little more sensitively, I think, than 50 euro whacking across the board. But at the end of the day, given the level of care that is provided with the medical care, given what you get with the medical care, which is unlimited free GP visits for an entire year, uh, I think there has to be a recognition that with the rising number of cars, somebody has to pay for this. Okay, Dr. Rory Hanley, columnist with the Irish Medical Times. Thanks very much for.